this series contains sexual references, adult themes and depictions of violence. If these things are upsetting for you, please take care while you're listening. From the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, this is Bondi Badlands, proudly sponsored by ACON and Waverley Council. Episode 5, Justice at Last. And that I had had such respect and such pride initially in being a police officer, and it was stripped entirely from me in that moment. We've made some inquiries, and uh, the registration and number of that car was an unmarked police vehicle. Welcome to Bondi Badlands, an investigation into a series of cliffside murders and mysterious disappearances in Sydney, Australia, in the late 1980s and early 1990s. I'm Greg Callahan, author and deputy editor of Good Weekend magazine and the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. Finally, some hope for justice. Back in 1989, Bondi police decided an inquest into the disappearance of Ross Warren wasn't necessary they decided he'd fallen accidentally into the sea and they concluded that was that. John Russell's death was granted an inquest, but it lasted a paltry 35 minutes at the Glebe Coroner's Court back in 1990. Gilles Matani's disappearance? Well, his life didn't even rate a lodged missing persons report, let alone an inquest. Now, 13 years later, all these likely murders were to be granted an inquest over two weeks in March 2003, to be reconvened in the September of the same year. Presiding over the inquest was the Deputy State Coroner, Jacqueline Millage, whose job it was to determine whether there was enough evidence from the investigations to turn this into a murder trial or murder trials. Sue Thompson, who was to give evidence herself at the inquest, remembers that time well. Look, I mean, one of the fabulous things about Operation Taradale going to the coroner's court was focusing a court's mind on these sort of cases and also being able to show that a lot of those cases hadn't been solved because some of the police at the time didn't care or would actively work against them being solved. And so the great thing about that was the opportunity to present to a court, the coroner's court, the major problem of gay hate murders. And again, it's another step in getting the public and the media and different agencies on side to go, wow, okay, this really is a problem. Sourcing information from the police database, Thompson had meticulously collated information on all the anti-gay murders across Sydney. She found 46 gay hate murders between 1988 and 1999, but this was likely to be an underestimate given it only accounted for reported homicides and did not include cases classified as disappearances suicides, or death by misadventure. Cliffs, Thompson decided, were a perfect murder weapon. When I used to keep my records on murders, I always listed cliffs as a weapon because cliffs were the easiest weapon. You didn't have to carry anything with you. All you had to do was go to a certain location and herd someone or push them off the edge. Page had compiled a list of principal persons of interest who were all subpoenaed to give evidence at the inquest. As these persons of interest filed in and out of the packed courtroom to give evidence, among them were Sean McAuliffe, David McAuliffe and Matthew Davis. The inquest received widespread news coverage, both in print and on television. There are seven people in that list, including brothers David and Sean McAuliffe. Currently serving time for the murder of another gay man, they sat in court in handcuffs. The inquest was told of shortcomings in the initial investigations back in the 80s. In the case of John Russell, significant evidence hair found in his hand was lost by police. Nina Stevens, National 9 News. Page organised for witnesses like Shark Muzi, Gilles Matani's former partner, who had to work all day to be driven to and from the coroner's court. While Ross Warren's mother Kay was deeply appreciative of Page's hard work on the case over three years, she explained to him that she'd find the hearings too much of an ordeal and didn't want to hear any distressing details about her son's likely murder. John Russell's father Ted and son Peter, on the other hand, turned up at the inquest every day, wanting to know as much as possible about John's death. Ross Warren's good friend Craig Ellis was in the court to witness proceedings day by day, Facing a wall of cameras outside the court, 
Peter Russell spoke with characteristic candour. It's been a very long wait for us for 14 years to get this far, so uh, we're just looking for a bit of closure. When David McMahon, the man who narrowly escaped death on the clifftops, is given the witness box, he's determined to tell the whole ugly story of the bashing on the clifftops. Wearing charcoal trousers and a white shirt, the compact 168 centimetre man delivers a calm 10 minute summary of the events of the night. He doesn't flinch as he describes the initial lacklustre response by the police. He doesn't bat an eyelid as he describes seeing his attackers around Bondi after the assault. Matthew Davis, in handcuffs and still serving his 12-year sentence for murdering Critchikor and Ratana Jarathaporn, is among the first persons of interest to take the witness box. As a teenager, he tells the packed courtroom, he was filthy with the world. Davis says he had no knowledge of what happened to John Russell, Ross Warren or Jill Matany. I was an angry young man, but I didn't do it, he tells the court. I will even take a polygraph test. One person of interest, identified in a bugged prison conversation between two of those responsible for the murder of Richard Johnson, deny being involved in any gay bashing. Patrick Sadie, counsel for police commissioner, accuses this person of completely misleading the inquest. No, I'm not, this person mutters, looking away. It would be another two years before Jacqueline Millage would bring down her findings from the inquest on a brisk morning in May 2005. As journalists frantically take notes in shorthand or type on their laptops, Millage delivers a blistering broadside aimed at Blondi police in the late 1980s. She describes the investigation into Ross Warren's death as grossly inadequate. Indeed, to characterise it as an investigation is to give it a label it does not deserve, she says. Of the investigation into John Russell's death, Millage notes the crime scene photograph showing the clump of hair in his left hand. She describes as disgraceful the fact this vital piece of forensic evidence was lost by the Bondi police. If the earlier investigations were inadequate and naive, in her words, Millage hails Operation Taradale as a shining example of how investigation should be conducted. She finds that Ross Warren and John Russell have been murdered. Those responsible for the deaths of Warren and Russell, however, would have been far too young at the time to be responsible for Gilles Matany's disappearance in September 1985. She finds that Matany is dead but where and how he died remains unknown, although there is a strong possibility he died in similar circumstances to the other men. The following news report by Adam Walters for National 9 News went to air on the night Millage brought down her findings. Fifteen years after their deaths on the cliffs of South Bondi, justice at last for Alan Russell and Wynn television presenter Ross Warren, whose body was never found. But today a coronial inquest found both were the victims of separate attacks by a so-called gay hate gang. While it was disappointing for Page that the inquest did not lead to any murder trials, the threshold of evidence deemed not high enough, his investigation threw a massive spotlight on the cases, which were no longer dismissed as deaths by misadventure or suicides. Outside the coroner's court, facing the press, Steve Page says he's hopeful that arrests will be made in the future. I hope this isn't the end. I hope someone picks it up and, um, you know, comes forward, gives us uh, us what we're after, and we put, uh, put the offenders before the courts. For the friends and family of the men who lost their lives at Bondi, there was final recognition that their loved ones had been murdered. We were able to uh, get enough evidence to put it back before the coroner for an inquest and we were able to have enough evidence to put before the coroner that she overturned the original um, inquest findings of um, John Russell and was able to come out with a finding of, uh, of murder. She accepted that uh, Ross Warren was also the, uh, the victim of a, uh, a murder and there, 
you've got to have a, a reasonable degree of evidence to be able to satisfy the courts of, uh, of that. And in relation to uh, the death of uh, Gil Matoni, he was left as open causes, but uh, with commentary that uh, also likely to need to be the victim of a, uh, a gay hate murder. To get this far was still a major accomplishment, says Sue Thompson. So to actually get that sort of um, coroner's court finding on those matters and to also get them to formally say that some of those police investigations were appalling uh, is really important because it's, you know, it's a sobering reminder to everybody about these are human lives that have been taken unfairly and terribly and, you know, we all need to get together to make sure it doesn't happen anymore. So, yeah, it was a great day and, and very powerful and Jackie Milliger did a really good job. Today, looking back on the original lacklustre investigation by the Bondi police into the deaths of Ross Warren and John Russell, Millage can't help but think that had there been arrests back then, had the likely killers been shown they can't kill people and get away with it, lives may have been saved. If they had looked at that, if, if there had been proper recognition that it was a beat, if they had looked at the methods that the men were employing to meet each other, if they were in tune to what was going on in, in, with regards to gay hate crime at the time Ross Warren went missing, if they'd have known all of that, if there'd have been at least a warning perhaps uh, to the gay community about this area, if the police had been alerted to it, if there'd been patrols, maybe Mr Russell may, may not have met his demise the way that he did. Millage was disappointed the inquest did not lead to a murder trial. I was satisfied that we had done the best we could have done in the circumstances. I was disappointed that we hadn't identified anybody to the proper standard where we could have referred it to the Director of Public Prosecutions for his consideration in taking matters to trial. That was disappointing. But in terms of getting some satisfaction for these families, um, I, I felt very pleased with what we had done and not only what I was feeling at the time, the impact of that finding has been very satisfying because we're still talking about it all these years later. But if you want to take it to trial, if you want to refer them to the, the DPP in the hopes that you're going to get them to trial, you've got to have evidence that can be sustained at trial. You've got to have, it's got to be beyond a reasonable doubt. Steve Page had spent five years searching for that one piece of compelling evidence or a witness who would take the investigation to a murder trial. I was uh, always hopeful that you'd get that, you know, what we call the famous phone call, where you just get that one lead that uh, gives you enough to prosecute and uh, putting it before a judge and jury. But ultimately, during my time with this matter, that didn't happen. Taradell, for me, is the one that got away. It's that one investigation that I hope sooner or later we get an outcome. Among the 30 persons of interest who passed through the coroner's court, both Page and Millage were in no doubt that some had knowledge of who killed John Russell and Ross Warren or were directly involved themselves. So you pretty much just had to sit there and listen to them. You knew that they weren't telling the truth. You, you just knew it. Um, and they were giving you all the reasons as to why they couldn't answer the questions. But there were, wasn't a lot that could be done about it. You could direct them to answer the questions, but then if you knew that it was going to leave them open uh, to prosecution or something, you had to give them an opportunity to remain silent. While Page's Operation Taradale didn't lead to any murder convictions, it did lead to jail time for many of the persons of interest for other offences, including drug trafficking. Unlucky for them, we had a lot of electronic surveillance on our uh, on our main targets, and whilst there wasn't a lot um, to specifically link uh, offenders to, um, to to killings, what they were doing when we were looking at them was involved in drug trafficking. So, in conjunction with the uh, the murder investigation, I've got all these multiple drug investigations that are running um, running along, and you know they're quite. Some were quite large. They involved the uh, the importation of ecstasy into uh, into the country. So um, that was um, certainly something that came back and uh, and bit a few of these um, you know suspects that they thought they you know, they got away with it, and uh, all of a sudden they were um, they'll be for the courts for you know uh, offences that you know that have quite uh, serious penalties also. 
Because of the renewed interest in the cases in recent years, Page hasn't given up hope that the killers of Warren and Russell will one day be convicted. There is always the possibility that someone will get charged with these and we can only hope that sooner or later they do. But I know with certainly um, one person of interest that I had from the uh, the Bondi boys that I you know I, I believe was involved in the death of uh, Russell and the one that got away got it in, in, in relation to that assault. And uh, you got to remember these are you know these are offences now that are 30 years ago and the offenders are they're reckless by nature. So more likely than not, if someone's going to meet a uh, an early death in relation to uh, karma, it's going to be them. They'll continue to be involved in uh, badness. They'll continue to make enemies and in the wrong circle of people. They're the kind of people that would honestly be looking over their shoulder for the rest of their lives and not just for these. Since Taradale, $100,000 rewards have been offered for information leading to the arrests of the killers of Russell, Warren and Matany. These have continued to generate publicity around the cases. Three men, three suspected victims of gay hate crime. We know that there are people out there who know what happened to these men. Today, three decades later, $100,000 rewards to help catch those responsible. Do rewards make a difference in solving crimes? Sue Thompson seems to think so. Sometimes people are very good at keeping secrets and I think that's one of the reasons why million-dollar rewards have been shown to be very effective often because... A $100,000 reward might not encourage someone to come forward and potentially put themselves at a little bit of risk, is how everyone would feel. Um, But a million-dollar reward is going to be a motivator for a lot of people. It's quite likely that there were other earlier murders at the Bondi Clifftops even before the disappearance of Gilles Matany in 1985 part of a long tradition of dismissing murders of gay men as suicides or accidents. Tony Cruz is a 73-year-old gay man who grew up in Sydney and went to the Bondi Clifftops in the 1960s. He remembers being told by an older gay man it was known as a dangerous beat back in the 1950s. I mean, because of our experiences and because of, of what we'd heard from other people, we suspected that a lot of these so-called accidental deaths or suicides were actually murder. They would be reported in something like the Sydney Morning Herald, it would be just a notice item of two or three paragraphs and you never hear anything again. I can still remember reading these items and my heart sinking because I think, you know, this is another murder. You felt helpless and you were helpless. This meant, of course, that the bashings, even very serious ones, were rarely reported. That was a given, that if you got bashed, it was just suck it up. Reporting it to the police was just going to make the whole thing worse. And they'd probably give you a hard time. I've heard of a couple of people who did report them and got a hard time. Tony also heard stories of police bashing gay men at Beats. You know, there was the grapevine and you'd get information about police bashes, I always got the feeling that for the police, the poof to bashes were doing half their job. The big question here is, was this bashing of gay men by police continuing into the 1980s? Mark Higginbotham was a sworn member of the New South Wales Police from May 1982 until July 1987. He was at Windsor Police Station for about a year and then at Darlinghurst for about a year before joining the Prosecutions Division, which is where he was working when he resigned. He now works as a senior sergeant with Victoria Police. He is also a lawyer and has pioneered improved practices for engaging and supporting sex crime victims in the court process. Mark's been married for 36 years and has two granddaughters, but it was the events at Darlinghurst Police Station back in 1983 that have been haunting him for decades. I I joined the police force with the intention of being a lawyer and uh, specifically I wanted to work in prosecutions. And I uh, enrolled in law immediately and knew I was headed towards work in courts and wanted some a fast education and um, volunteered to go to Darlinghurst Police Station in 1983. Um, Found myself exposed to... Uh, illegal, corrupt 
abusive conduct by many of the staff that worked at that police station at that time. And I left the police force a couple of years later, extremely disappointed uh, and, and very, very angry about what I'd seen. And I think that the thing that was most disturbing initially for me was the baton charging that I saw occur maybe five times at Moore Park. And I, I can remember very, very clearly the first time that I was tasked to be at the scene of that and not really understanding initially what was, what was going on. So it was four or five police units parked there. I, I remember that there was an effort made to be stealthy. I think that was part of the, the operation, if you like. I was never given instructions other than to follow. And I can remember walking across the park and other police surging forward, battens out. And I can remember standing back from toilet blocks there and, and hearing conf physical confrontation in the toilet blocks and not really understanding what, what it was that was the cause of that. I, I, I mean, I was naive enough to think that we were looking at arresting people, harassing other people or the possibility of I mean, mugging was a very big thing in Darlow in those days. But after it had happened a few times, I realised that it was uh, it was the men gathering for uh, public sex that was the exclusive target of, of these uh, operations. And I feel a deep sense of shame. Mark's memory is that there could have been up to 10 policemen in three to five cars. I clearly can recall people fleeing. I would call this a baton, baton charge or advance. Uh, I, what, I, what I do remember is that um, while, while I was at Darlinghurst, New South Wales Police changed the nature of the baton that was standard issue for street policing. And um, in 1982, and up until for a long time, up until 1982, the standard weapon, if you like, uh, uh, was a rubbery truncheon. But in 1983, New South Wales Police adopted a different weapon, and that was um, maybe a 70 centimetre long aluminium piece of tubing. I think initially it actually had a, a side handle on it, but it was a completely different thing, um, much, much more uh, able to damage. And I, and I have a, a, an image burned in my mind of, of police holding those things, um, walking across that, that grass. I am positive that police went into the toilets and hit people. A turning point came when Mark arrested a man for a gay bashing and brought the offender into Darlinghurst Police Station. I um, was working uh, in a marked sedan and I was the senior of the two constables. So I remember it was twilight, probably winter, 1983. There was a man who was significantly injured on the footpath approaching the police station. He was by himself. And I, he was clearly going to the police station. And I can remember immediately thinking he was gay. And he told me he'd been beaten by a random, but not his words, but told me he'd been beaten and it was obvious that it was gay hate crime, like it was completely obvious. And I asked him if he was well enough to come for a patrol. I mean, it's much better to get onto these things if you want to try to intervene well. So he said yes and he jumped in the back of the police sedan and the three of us started a fairly random patrol pattern um, on the Surrey Hills side of Oxford Street, not far from the police station. And Pretty quickly, the victim um, said, that's him, points out a bloke by himself on the footpath. And I remember we, uh, he stayed in the car, the victim, and my partner and I confronted the suspect. He had enough to arrest him, but we didn't need it because he was very violent towards us. And um, got him cuffed and radioed for a transport vehicle. Don't put a man like that in a police car, certainly not alongside the victim. He was taken back to Darlinghurst. We got back there similar time. And the way it worked at Darlinghurst in those days is there was a rostered charge crew in the charge area and you presented the suspect to the charge crew 
told them what they were to be charged with and they put them through the process. So I remember just indicating that we were dealing with an indictable assault and uh, he was to be charged. And I wrote out a fact sheet and I was finishing that off when I realised that alongside me was the managing sergeant for the shift, so the senior person in the police station at the time. And the power indifference between a sergeant in 1983, a mature man, and and a constable was extraordinary. This is, I mean, it's don't look me in the eye, don't use my name um, type of power indifference. And he was screaming at me. He was screaming at me in rage about the fact that I had arrested someone for gay hate crime. Some excerpts include, we don't charge people with poof to bashing here. Screamed, not, not spoken. And um, it was protracted. Like, it was, it was a, a long, vehement speech to me, condemning me for doing it. It sort of ended with him storming off and me standing like, like a child in the police station, humiliated, absolutely humiliated, and completely, completely overcome with disbelief that this is the culture I was part of and that I'd had such respect and such pride initially in being a police officer, and it was stripped entirely from me in that moment. I am angry with him now, and I was just left gasping. And it went ahead. The, the, the bloke was charged. He was bailed to Alsa Ray Street Court, I would imagine, and he pleaded guilty. But the victim was an educated man. He was the owner, publisher, writer of a gay city newspaper, something I didn't know, but something I became aware of because he wrote me up in the paper. And that became a huge problem that I had brought public shame on the police station by bringing public compliments about servicing the public service needs of the gay victim of gay hate crime. I, I had doubled down on my sins by not only doing it, by, by it being public. And what, what happened from there was uh, I was made persona non grata by you know, just classic bullying um, by a good part of the station. Certainly every person at the station with any social force about them, uh, the engine room, if you like, for the social energy in the station were two particular senior constables who'd been there for ages and they both turned on me in quite a strong way. But what happened from that point on is that in the tasking parade, people would refuse to work with me and, and I was identified as a faggot. That the, I can remember that word being used repeatedly. Well, I'm not insulted by the fact that they used a term that means in some context homosexual. Um, I'm, I'm insulted and angry about the fact that that was meant to be socially destroying for me, and, and it was. And no one, the, the sergeant running the parade, never once did anything about it. It was just people were given a right of veto about me. And, and you know, it's being like being picked last at the school dance. I, I'd end up just working a shift with another constable and doing a foot patrol shift somewhere. But I didn't know how to respond to that at the time either. I'm a senior sergeant, incidentally, um, in Victoria Police, I have thought of myself at that time and, and the leadership I, I try to bring uh, is to be the leader I'd hoped for or needed at that time. And there was absolutely no leadership that was offered that in any way contradicted, if not overtly supported, the clear homophobia that was part of the experience that I was subjected to. If police from more than one police station in Sydney's inner city were bashing gays in 1983, was this behaviour still going on by the late 1980s? You'll remember the story of bashing victim Alan Rosendale in episode three, and the man, Paul Symes, who witnessed the brutal attack on the western fringe of Moore Park on the evening of May 5, 1989. 
Symes describes seeing a group of men, not teenagers, pulling objects that look like pieces of wood out of the boot of two cars and charging across the park in an organised fashion. Symes took down the registration number of one of the cars and reported the attack to police. The uh, gay police liaison, that role had sort of relatively recently been established. So I rang that um, that group and reported what I had seen to them. And um, so they took all the details down of the registration of the car and of the dates and the times. And then um, some weeks later, they, they called me back and said, look, uh, we've made some inquiries and the incident that you have reported, uh, the registration and number of that car was an um, unmarked police vehicle and we would like you to come into the police centre and be interviewed by um, the police to talk about what you saw. The officer that met us and talked to us had very, you know, a lot of gold braid and buttons on and so he was, but he was obviously a senior officer. I, I told my story to him and he uh, had a, a secretary there, a, a policewoman, and he sent her, you know, had a word with her and sent her away to, and she brought back a police baton and he said, oh, do you think uh, when you talk about planks of wood, he said, do you think you could have seen something like this? And I immediately realised that when I'd shone my headlights on the assault that was happening to Alan, that the lights had been glittering on metal. So I knew that there was police batons involved. I also still think there were planks of wood as well. But so I had that sort of breakthrough moment in that office and I said, yes, I think it was. And I shared that with him and um, he went, yes, yes. Well, we know who they were. And he said they were the detectives who were in our squad. They were sort of um, loose cannon type detectives who uh, they weren't the drug squad and they weren't the the murder squad, but they were they were sort of like on call to to hunt down bad guys and you know evildoers. And that, that night that, of that particular assault, they reported they were chasing a suspect across Moore Park from a stabbing that had happened and that they hadn't apprehended anyone. So really, this um, police officer said to me, there's nothing we can do about this situation, but we've had problems with this group before and we're going to disband them. Actor and former rugby league player Ian Roberts was ready to come out at the end of 1989 between his move from the South Sydney Rabbitohs to Manly Warringah. But the epidemic of violence happening across Sydney at the time made him hesitate. And if he needed further convincing, the terrible public backlash against English footballer Justin Fashionu, the first footballer to come out of the closet in October 1990, convinced him to stay in the closet. Roberts came out in 1994. Those murders were kind of terrifying, like because it happened to people my age, it was happening to my generation. In the late 80s, I was totally aware of all the violence that was happening towards gay men, the bashings, uh, NLE, Bondi, uh, Vaucluse, all on the walkways around, around the beaches, particularly also over in the in northern suburbs as well. Uh, a lot of those beats were, were, were men were bashed. I mean, Back in the day, this is before internet, you know, we, we, and we had the gay rags. I used to follow that stuff religiously. I absolutely saw the, the violence firsthand. I was present when uh, people were bashed. I mean, I, I, I was set upon myself at exchange, and that was inside the pub. Outside the courthouse, I had a confrontation. Now, they're just, their times are just spring to mind for, for me personally. There was always an element of danger being on Oxford Street. Any gay man, particularly around my age, this wouldn't be a, a, an unfamiliar thing. We, we've all seen bashings, we've all seen people who cause trouble, uh, who have come out to poof to bash people. The thing is, with, with poof to bashing, it, it's always a king hit. I suppose because of the sport I play and my own personal history, I was able to look after myself and defend myself. I mean, if someone my size is attacked, then anyone can be attacked. Back in the late 80s, 89, 90, when I was wanting to come out and I didn't, I could never have envisioned that, that, that like 23, 24 years later, we would have marriage equality. I, I never, ever thought that was going to happen. Like, inclusion costs nothing. Like it, and I just feel like it's such a no-brainer for, for where we're at as a culture at the moment. In October 2021, a memorial was opened at the Bondi Headland to honour the lives lost to anti-LGBTQ plus hate crime. 
It's called Rise and is a striking six-level stone terrace representing the six bands of the pride flag. It's the perfect place to sit and reflect on the lives lost here while looking out to sea. As we have seen in this podcast, hate crimes are exactly as they sound. They're about saying gays or lesbians or trans people don't deserve to live, and this is what we're going to do to them. Hate crimes aren't about money, although they can involve robbery, or jealous rage or desperation. They're about hate fueled violence, and more likely than not, it's frenzied violence. Earlier this year, a parliamentary inquiry regarding the New South Wales Police's response to hate crimes against the LGBTQ plus community in Sydney between 1970 and 2010 recommended a judicial inquiry. Um, at the moment, a parliamentary inquiry can't do that, um, but we need the powers of a judge to compel witnesses to give evidence about what has occurred uh, in relation to uh, the crimes themselves, but also in re relation to why they weren't investigated by the police to the degree that they needed to have been done. That's Nick Parkhill, the CEO of ACON. Sue Thompson and Steve Page retired from the force in the early 2000s. But even after all this time, both are still hopeful arrests will be made for the murders of Ross Warren and John Russell. Over the past 18 months, there have been two separate arrests for the alleged murders of two gay men in the late 1980s, one in a park in Sydney's Ramwick, the other at North Head in Manly. Here's Sue Thompson. The moment you get someone who stands up and goes, well, I was a witness to this murder and it's played on my conscience for decades and now I'm coming forward because I know who did it and I'm going to tell the truth because that is my responsibility as a human being to do that. Like so many other gay men across Sydney in the late 1980s, John Russell and Ross Warren lost their lives, not because they were involved in a crime or had fought with a jealous lover or had decided to end it all. They were killed because they were gay. Bondi Badlands is sponsored by Waverley Council and ACON, a New South Wales-based health promotion organisation specialising in community health, inclusion and HIV responses for people of diverse sexualities and genders. Special thanks to our podcast guests Sue Thompson, Jacqueline Millage, Steve Page, Tony Cruz, Mark Higginbotham, Paul Symes, Ian Roberts and Nicholas Parkhill. Special thanks also to Michael Atkinson, formerly of ACON. Our thanks to Georgina Jennings at Nine Archives. Bondi Badlands is based on the book of the same name by Greg Callahan, who narrates the podcast. Original theme and podcast production by Ian Cuthbertson. If this podcast has raised issues for you, contact ACON on 1800 063 060, Lifeline on 13114, or Beyond Blue on 1300 22 46 36.